uh, I want to talk about how I see uh, the different pieces of what we are starting to talk about as a climate movement or a global warming movement coming together. I want to talk about some of the most hopeful uh, ad ad advances in the last, especially year, um, that are getting us towards that tipping point, taking us to scale. And then I just want to conclude with a few thoughts on, on some pitfalls that I hope we can avoid as this, as this movement be continues to become ad aggregated and expanded. That social movements are successful not when a policy is enacted, but when society as a whole has accepted those values and it's not seen what you're working for as the province of one uh, constituency, one political party, or just one sector of society. I do not equate the environmental movement with the climate and the, and the global warming movement. So I come from the same roots of the environmental movement, but I'm really starting to see the climate movement as something far larger, not a sub-issue within the environmental movement, but a movement of its own of which the environment is just a piece. So many of the students that I work with across the country are coming to this from human rights concerns um, or from national security concerns. And really, you know, even if they've never gone out hiking uh, in, in wh wherever they're from, they still see this as a moral issue s without the environmental piece. Um, I think that another reason this is different from the environmental movement or any other social movement that has ever happened in human history is, that, is what I call the exceptionalism of global warming. For most issues that we work on, especially in a policy sense, whether it's education or healthcare or civil rights, if you don't get the progress that you want this year, there's always the next legislative session, two or four or six years down the road. And that makes it very easy to say, well, let's not have the perfect be the enemy of the good. Let's go halfway and then come back and fight again in eight years. Science, the, the level of emissions, and, and David was talking about you know, 450 parts per million being the tipping point. Tim Flannery, a scientist, um, just leaked some of the results from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, and they're saying that it's up around 455 parts per million equivalent of CO2 and around 430 parts per million carbon dioxide, which is happening a lot faster than, than people thought. So if we don't use science and those very clear tipping points that at the two degree level, probably somewhere between 425 and 450 parts per million as our guide to send the market signals now about what we need to do to, to, uh, in the next five, 10 years so that we get to where we need to be by 2050. If we don't do that in the next year or two and generate massive public investment, then a lot of scientists think that we will pass that tipping point. And you know, who, what good is it to come back four or six years later when we don't have a way to get that carbon dioxide or, that, or those greenhouse gases back down? I frequently try and read about other social movements to, for inspiration and guidance. After the uh, Civil Rights Act had passed, Martin Luther King received the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, he went to England and he came back and he had a meeting with President Lyndon Johnson. And he said, the Civil Rights Act is important, but until we put a very fine point on the rights of African Americans as it pertains to voting and pass a Voting Rights Act, then we won't have the progress that we need. Johnson's reply to him, we cannot do that for another 10 years. I've used all my political capital. That's outrageous. Um, you should be happy with what you've got now, and we'll come back to that in a decade. Instead of doing that, instead of setting his goals based on what Johnson told him was politically possible, King had as a guide what he thought was morally necessary. And instead of 10 years later, he left Johnson op Johnson's office and helped organize the march from Selma to Montgomery. The Voting Rights Act passed a year later, one year later. What we need to do should be defined by what we see as necessary um, and not by what is politically possible in the moment, because that is always changing. And I think that one of the reasons that momentum is happening is because of all of this organizing that's happening across the country um, in many different communities. And I just want to talk about a few of the things that I think are most exciting.
a coalition called the Energy Action Coalition. We worked on a nationwide, actually U.S. and Canada uh, campaign called the Campus Climate Challenge. The challenge is an, a three-year effort to make our campuses models of sustainability, to get to reduce emissions on campus as close to zero as possible, as quickly as possible. How we get to a carbon neutral economy and, and, and um, way of doing things. A year after we started that campaign, college presidents got together and they said, we need a framework for how to do this. And they started something called the American Colleges and Universities President's Climate Commitment. And they set up a framework for how to go carb carbon neutral by, uh, by 2050 or before. And they set very public timelines about doing um, greenhouse gas emissions inventories and first steps in terms of, you know, the, the easiest, the, the biggest step, the most important step is the efficiency that can be done right away. But we've also seen there are over 20 schools now running on 100% wind energy or clean energy. None of us have the capacity. None of us have the power to get, take this movement to where it needs to be unless we step back and put our own institutional or organizational goals behind the goals of the movement and design a campaign for this entire country to help build a movement. We've got 35 organizations now running the exact same campaign, something called One Sky. Has anyone, ever heard, has anyone here heard of the One Sky? Working really closely with the folks at Step It Up, which uh, has their next day of action coming up on November 3rd, right? Who's a leader? Um, they've been inviting decision makers at every level of government to turn out to these local events and say, are you behind what is necessary? You know, in major public investments to build the clean energy economy, switch our, sub, switch our public investments away from oil and coal towards clean energy. We can, we, can, we can make sure that there are green pathways out of poverty, create five million new jobs in the clean energy and energy efficiency sectors. Um, they're talking about the goals that science is saying is necessary, not just 80% reductions by 2050, but also 30% reductions by 2020. Um, and in addition to that, what's the, what's the third piece of the platform? Uh, no new coal. We can't, we can't be putting any more coal plants online uh, if, if we're going to have any chance of doing this, especially looking at the new numbers of, of emissions. That is an entirely different model. That's aspirational. That's saying we need to be based on what the moment demands of us, what future generations demand of us, not, not this kind of feasibility piece. This isn't just an environmental policy challenge. We need to be thinking about how we need to orient our society in the 21st century to get there. That's less of a cap and trade question than it is a, what is the new New Deal for our century? How do we direct public investments to switch to a clean energy economy instead of fossil fuels? And how do we make sure in that doing that we don't widen income and, and, and race uh, inequalities that have happened as a result of the fossil fuel inequality, environmental justice concerns. If the internet had been started, first of all, it couldn't have been started with just private investment. There simply wasn't enough capital. It, ha it wouldn't have happened if the Department of Defense hadn't been pouring the, you know, the amazing amounts of money that it was pouring into building. And if it had happened with private investment instead of public investment, we wouldn't see the internet that we have today. You would have multi-tiered internet systems. And you would only get good service based on how much, if you were willing to pay a premium. But that's one of the other things we need to think about. Is our political system, is our election system set up to allow for the kind of transformational change we need? And if not, how are we going to work towards that? I hope Maine's clean election model spreads not just to Arizona, where it also is, but all across the country. You know, when I think about why I'm motivated to do this, it has future generations and my responsibility to them doesn't really come up in my mind. I think about my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents and the over 10,000 generations of human history that have allowed us to get to this point. All of the sacrifice that they've gone through, all of the advances that they made in philosophy and music and science that allow us to stand on their shoulders, and for just a few more cheap years of oil because we're not willing to be in an innovative and bold, are we going to throw away all of that work that has happened throughout the human experiment? And are we going to be the generation that lets them down? That's why I'm motivated to do this. Future generations are important, but so are all the people who got us to this point. One of those people is 
uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And he gave a speech exactly a year before he was killed, in which he said, there is an invisible book of life, and it faithfully records either our vigilance or our neglect. At this moment in time, more than any other, we must err on the side of vigilance 